We all have stress in our lives, but either you manage your stress or it will manage you. The problem is you may not have all the tools you need in your toolbox to gain control. Let's change that. You're listening to Healthy Looks Great on You, a lifestyle medicine podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Vicki Petz Casper. This is episode 103, Manage Your Stress So It Doesn't Manage You. You'll learn about the different kinds of stress, how it affects your health, and research proven ways to get control. If there's one thing I can guarantee, it's that you will experience stress today, tomorrow, and the next day. We all do, but don't let it overwhelm you. I'm going to help you restock your toolbox so you can learn to manage stress. Stress affects everyone. It can affect your physical, emotional, and spiritual health. Stress is everywhere. It can make you sick, and it can kill you. In fact, 80% of primary care visits are related to stress and lifestyle. There are three types of stress, good, neutral, and bad. Wait, did I say good stress? Yep. Good stress is what drives you to get the house clean before a party, or meet a project deadline at work. That kind of stress gives you a rush of adrenaline and it actually helps you perform better and get things done faster. Good things like starting a new job, getting married, moving, or having a baby are also considered good stress. Neutral stress is something stressful that occurs, but it doesn't really affect you personally. Like things you see on the news. You can watch a tragedy unfold on the screen and then go about your day without it really affecting you. For example, there was a recent avalanche which buried skiers. It's terrible, but it won't change your life. And that's not a bad thing to not be personally affected. Because listen, your day has enough trouble of its own. We cannot take on the whole world's stress. Not that some people don't try. Consuming stress has become a pastime with social media and 24-hour news programming. Now, I don't disagree that you need to know what's happening in the world, but too much news can feed anxiety and depression. Whether it's negative thoughts, unforgiveness, or discontentment, whatever you feed in your mind, it will grow and grow. So beware and watch your intake of anything that moves you in the wrong direction. Next, there's bad stress, and it's bad for you. Bad stress is further divided into acute, which is sudden and temporary, or chronic, which is ongoing. Acute bad stress can be relatively minor, like being stuck in a traffic jam when you really need to get somewhere. Or it can be major, such as if someone you loved was on those ski slopes when the avalanche came down and you're waiting to know if they're okay. It's bad, but it's short-lived. Then there's chronic bad stress. The severity has a wide range, but this is the one that's the worst for your health. Chronic bad stress can result from things like work-related issues, marital struggles, or financial strain. And if someone you loved was injured in that avalanche and now had long-standing health problems and you had to take care of them, that would be chronic bad stress. And chronic bad stress is the one that will get you. It keeps the body in a perpetual heightened state of arousal, looking for danger and always ready to respond. That's not good for your health, not physically or emotionally. And here's the deal. Stress doesn't just affect you. It's contagious. It impacts your family and friends and sometimes even strangers you interact with. How does stress affect you? Different people manifest their stress in different ways. You may carry it in muscle tension in your neck, shoulders, or jaw. Some people are affected in their gut with GI distress like nausea, heartburn, indigestion, upset stomach, or diarrhea. (laughs) <laughs> and let me give you a little hint. No matter how much that silly lady dressed in pink sings the diarrhea song, Pepto-Bismol is not going to take your stress away. Maybe you get headaches or have fatigue and completely run out of energy. Your sleep and appetite may be affected by stress. You can even get sick more often because your immune system is impaired. That may be what happened to me. I'm a little bit under the weather today, and I've experienced some significant stress this week. I'll tell you more about that later. You might have anxiety, restlessness, sweating, dizziness, and shakiness. It's difficult to focus when you're stressed, and you can feel overwhelmed. Stress can also turn you into a big old grouch pot, so be careful with those frayed nerves. 
even your heart can be affected. One time a few years ago, I was under a tremendous amount of stress. And I woke up during the middle of the night and I felt like there was a fish flopping in my chest. And I was gulping for air. You see, my heart was out of rhythm due to palpitations. And it was all brought on by stress. How can something so ubiquitous be so harmful? Well, don't get too nervous about it. But it's time for us to head to the classroom. We're going to mini medical school to learn about the nervous system. And after that, we're going to talk about research-proven methods to manage stress. Now let's start with the basics. Nerve cells are called neurons. We have billions of them throughout our bodies. There are about 100 billion in the brain alone. And these neurons talk to each other through chemical and electrical signals. The nervous system can be divided in different ways. The central nervous system is command central and it's protected by bony structures. It consists of the brain and spinal cord and it's located inside the skull and spinal column. All of the other nerves in the body make up the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system is further divided into the autonomic and somatic nervous systems. We're going to focus on the autonomic nervous system because it plays a key role in the physical response to stress. The autonomic nervous system has two counteracting divisions, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system controls the so-called fight or flight response. You've probably heard of that. And it gets activated when we encounter stress or something we perceive to be a threat. Last summer, my car was parked outside, and I walked into the garage to pick up a broom off the ground. And there was a long, black garden snake slithering on the handle. My sympathetic nervous system kicked into overdrive, and I screamed, help! And I ran as fast as Usain Bolt to my car, rolled up the windows, and locked the door. My husband was inside, and he thought I fell and was seriously injured. When I told him through the glass what had happened, he laughed and asked if I thought the snake could get into my car. I told him, I just need you to understand that snakes are not funny, and I was protecting myself. Flight, and if necessary, ready to fight. When your body perceives a threat, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis switches into high gear. Now, don't get unnerved with the medical terminology. I'll break it down. The hypothalamic pituitary adrenal, or HPA axis, is the connection between the central nervous system and the endocrine system. Think command center using hormones to rally the troops. The initial alert comes in through our senses. Smell of smoke, sound of an alarm, seeing a slithering reptile, touching something sharp. Danger, danger is conveyed to the hypothalamus by an area of the brain called the amygdala. And this happens instantaneously because the amygdala is the emotional part of the brain. It reacts before thinking and it sends an SOS to the hypothalamus and the cascade begins with a surge of epinephrine or adrenaline. After that, the HPA axis ramps up the sympathetic nervous system until the parasympathetic nervous system steps in and calms everybody down. Moving to the lab, let's dissect the HPA axis. The hypothalamus is part of the brain and it's located in the center about the size of a walnut. This is where the stress signal comes in. The pituitary gland is near the base of the brain, and when it gets marching orders, it sends a message to the adrenal glands to mobilize and dump hormones. The adrenal glands are little triangular-shaped glands, and they sit right on top of the kidneys. They release two major stress hormones, adrenaline, also known as epinephrine, and cortisol, which is the stress hormone. Cortisol is a necessary hormone that is secreted throughout the day in varying amounts. It usually spikes when you wake up, and that increases concentration. Then it kind of peters out through the day. When cortisol levels increase, that mobilizes glucose and fatty acids out of the liver into the bloodstream so that your body has extra energy to combat that threat of danger. The release of epinephrine and cortisol make your heart race. They make you breathe faster. Your blood pressure goes up. Your muscles tense. And blood vessels in the arms and legs open up so that you're ready to run and lock yourself in the car away from that dangerous garden snake. And don't argue with me about that. I hate all snakes. All of this happens in a fraction of a second because a snake in the garage is an emergency situation. In other words, it's acute stress. 
Once the crisis resolves and the snake is dead and gone, your body is supposed to return to homeostasis or a balanced state. This balance is fine-tuned by opposing processes between the sympathetic nervous system, which we just discussed, and the parasympathetic nervous system. If you think of fight or flight when you think of the sympathetic nervous system, think of feed and breed or rest and digest when you think of the parasympathetic nervous system. It's the part of the system that tells your body to chill out. The parasympathetic nervous system stimulates production of saliva, which contains enzymes to help digest your food. The parasympathetic nervous system also controls your bladder, bowel, and sexual function. So after the crazy snake incident was over, adrenaline and cortisol levels decrease, then the parasympathetic nervous system drives everything back to normal. But it's all a very delicate balance. When the autonomic nervous system hijacks the body because of chronic stress, it really wreaks havoc. Both the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems have significant effects on the immune system. Immune function can be impaired and systemic inflammation persists when chronic stress is in charge of the body. That's why it damages your body and it's associated with type 2 diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and heart disease. And it can lower bone density and dampen memory and impair learning. Not only that, but cortisol is a big player in the regulation of appetite and weight. Chronic stress is associated with weight gain, especially in the abdominal fat. And we all know that belly fat has negative effects on the health. This snowball keeps rolling and causes insulin resistance, which results in elevated blood sugar, cholesterol, triglycerides, and blood clotting factors. Wound healing is impeded, sleep is affected, pain and fatigue are magnified, and mood, well, let's just assume it's not going to be represented by a smiley face emoji. All of this is a setup that can turn into a downward spiral. Stressed out people are more likely to make poor lifestyle choices, develop or continue bad habits, and have a generally unhealthy lifestyle that shortens life expectancy. Whew, if that's not stressful, I don't know what is. Chronic bad stress that continues over a long period of time keeps all of these processes that are designed to help you out when there's a threat going and going. Those elevations in heart rate and respiratory rate and blood pressure, they're meant to be temporary. Continued release of cortisol due to constant ongoing stress strains the heart and blood vessels. That puts you at increased risk for chronic hypertension, depression, stroke, and heart attack. We already know that stress is unavoidable because it's part of life. But here's the deal. How you handle stress matters tremendously. That's why it's important to sharpen those tools in your toolbox. Do you need more coping skills to manage everyday stress or chronic stress? I'm going to guess the answer is yes. But first, let's evaluate your stress level. How stressed out are you? There's actually a validated way to measure it. It's called the Perceived Stress Scale. And rather than explain it, I created a download for you in the show notes. Just click on the link and you can answer the questions and then make sure you're signed up for my email list so you can see how you scored. As a bonus, you'll get the seven-day prescription for change, which is a free mini course to help you decide what lifestyle changes you want to make and how to get started. Now, before you get stressed out about taking a test, Let's talk about coping. Obviously, it's more complicated than singing Let It Go like Elsa in the movie Frozen. I'll spare you the stress of listening to me sing, but seriously, you do need to let it go. Some of you have such a firm grip, you may need a crowbar to pry it away. Listen, any tool you have will become more natural, more automatic, efficient, and effective the more often you use it. So let's look at some stress management tips and start practicing how to use them. First, let's pull some creativity out of the toolbox. Activities like singing, playing a musical instrument, dancing, painting, drawing, or any other form of art challenges our brain to form new connections from the left side of the brain to the right side. By challenging the brain, new pathways can form. With some effort, you can literally retrain your brain. That's one reason why adult coloring books and puzzles are so popular. Quilting, sewing, or knitting can also tap into your creative powers. Listening to music can instantly change your mood. It can also distract from pain. When I was practicing gynecology, sometimes patients would choose to put in earbuds 
for a painful procedure. The difference in their pain perception was noticeable. So when life hurts, crank up the music. As I was preparing for this podcast, I thought of several friends who are great resources. I'm going to put links in the show notes, but I highly recommend some guy named Rob's music to soothe your nerves. And while you're whistling a tune, you might try sticking your hands in the dirt too. Gardening has some anti-anxiety effects. Unless you're like me and it stresses you out to see those droopy brown leaves because you never watered your plants. But here's the deal. Sticking something in the ground and walking away, eh, that doesn't really count as gardening. It's nursing blooms to open, caring for seedlings and those little tendrils. That's where the benefits take root and grow. If you'd like to learn how to get started growing vegetables, check out Beginner Gardener by Jill McSheehy. Even if you have a black thumb, time in nature alleviates stress. And we all know sunlight has a huge impact on mood, hence the term seasonal affective disorder that makes people feel sadness in the winter months. Even in the winter, it helps to get outside. The sound of rushing water from a river or the ocean has calming power. Trees, rocks, and flowers spark inspiration and hope, which is the opposite of stress. So get out and intentionally savor life. See the beauty in nature. Taste your food. Inhale pleasant smells. Wrap up in a cozy blanket and relax. Add a good book to the mix, and you might feel that tension start to relax its grip. Slow down your spinning mind and take time to notice the good things in life. Experience appreciation and express it to others. Gratitude is research proven to change your negative outlook. That's why we're told to give thanks in all things. When I was so sick, I couldn't do much more than sit. I chose to sit outside on my porch. The view was incomparable. Listening to birds singing and watching for deer soothed my soul. But my stress level was through the roof and bitterness threatened to poison my soul. In fact, I wrote a whole book about it. There's a link for that in the show notes too. Want to know what I did to cope? I counted my blessings out loud. Literally, I was thankful for everything starting at the moment I was born healthy because many are not. My friend Jamie Bradley has a gratitude jar. And when someone does something she appreciates, she writes it down and puts it in the jar. And then when she feels prompted, she pulls it out and sends it to the person talk about a boomerang magnifying way to alleviate stress, intentionally appreciating others, recording that gratitude, and then passing it right back to the person who gave it to you. I love that. Gratitude and counting your blessings are research proven methods to help manage stress. So is breathing. I know we're all breathing, but I'm talking about breathing techniques that have a physiological effect on your body. First is belly breathing. Put one hand on your chest and one hand on your belly. Now breathe in and let your belly expand like a balloon. This expands the diaphragm. And guess what the diaphragm affects? The correct answer is the autonomic nervous system. It lowers your heart rate and blood pressure. See why all that science was important? Now, isn't this all starting to make sense? Don't underestimate the power of breathing. There are other techniques you can use. For example, four, seven, eight breathing. Inhale through the nose for four seconds. Hold for seven seconds. Then breathe out through the mouth for eight seconds. Four, seven, eight. There's another technique called box breathing. For this one, you need to remember four, 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 four. Breathe in through your nose for four seconds. Hold for four seconds. Breathe out through your mouth for four seconds. Pause for four seconds and repeat. I'm not lying. This really helps me focus on the golf course, and it improves my game. We were created to breathe. We were also created to live in community. Relationships and connections are crucial. So spend time with family and friends and participate in activities that feed your soul. Social support is crucial for your emotional health. Your spiritual health is important, too. You know, health is like a three-legged stool, physical, emotional, and spiritual. If you remove any leg, that stool is going to fall over. So pray and meditate on scripture. Maybe in a prayer-like fashion, you could simply breathe in gratitude and breathe out stress. 
Attend religious services and participate in activities with like-minded believers. You want to know why that makes a difference? Because worship shifts our focus. Look outside. If you see the sun shining, think about this. You can actually block the light of the sun with something as small as a dime. That is, if you put it right in front of your eye. Focusing on your problems is like that. It blocks out the light. Shifting your focus changes your perspective. Another way to take the focus off of your own problems and yourself is serving others. Once I had a patient who lived alone, and she had to have a bilateral mastectomy. She told me with great joy how she was put in a room with another lady who was struggling, and she was able to help her. Man, that really made an impression on me. Instead of feeling sorry for herself, she took it as an opportunity to help someone else. Look, I know that's easier said than done. These are tools for stress management, not treatments for depression or generalized anxiety disorder. More significant mental health issues usually cannot be overcome with a positive attitude and a prayer. But check out the book, Overcoming Anxiety. Dr. Michelle Bingston is a neuropsychologist, and she writes a lot about anxiety and depression. While I was researching for this episode, a curveball came at me personally. Instead of the classroom, I guess I went on the field trip. Because life's been pretty smooth for me lately, and my tools got a little rusty. And then something sent me into a tailspin. All of this stuff I was writing about went straight out the window. You know, it's easier to write about managing stress than to actually do it in the moment. Fortunately, my husband looked at me and said, why don't you go outside and enjoy the beautiful day? We were in the mountains, and I spent some quiet time alone, inhaling the crisp air, and I exerted myself enough to get my blood flowing. And then I calmed down. I was able to focus enough to pray and remember I'm not in control of the universe. A few years ago, when I was under a lot of stress, I saw a counselor. And the most powerful thing she told me is, there's nothing you can do about it. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. If you need help getting started with prayer, check out Susie Yeller's book and podcast, Prayer Starters. This podcast is just a few minutes. She shares a verse and then gets you started with prayer. One of the most powerful tools in your toolbox is an ink pen. Writing is my go-to technique, but you don't have to publish books or write articles to use writing as therapy. Words spilled out of a hurting heart have healing power. I always say a journal is a cheap psychiatrist. And the new update on your iPhone has a journal app now, so if you prefer digital, that's an option, and you always have it with you. Writing out those blessings you're counting and things you're grateful for is way more powerful than just thinking about it. Now let's try a different but practical exercise that's been shown to help manage stress. Write out how you want others to remember you. This helps you identify your values and tap into your strengths. Most people aren't really aware of their core strengths. The seven-day prescription for change course that I told you about earlier has an exercise in a free downloadable workbook to identify your strengths. Then you can learn to improve on them once you identify them and that can encourage ongoing hope for the future. And we can all probably agree that we want to be remembered for being kind to others. It turns out that positive interactions with others alone helps boost our own mood. So smile when you pass people. And don't forget to laugh, even in the face of trials. Laughter really is the best medicine, and there's always a great opportunity to find joy, blessings, and humor. Physical activity helps alleviate stress too, so get up and move. Even a short burst of exercise helps relieve tension in the body. You know what else is important? Playing. I think that's why pickleball has taken off so well. It's fun, and we need a little more fun in this stressful world we live in. So you get to choose. Sit on the couch and get riled up about all the terrible things you see online or on TV, or get out in the sun and have a little fun. There's a little twist on a Bible verse I heard once, and it's flipping truths to the opposites to make a point. Think about things that are controversial, stressful, upsetting, and heartbreaking. Then you will experience headaches, clenched teeth, and a grinding jaw. Keep focusing on them, and you'll have insomnia and cold or sweaty hands. (laughs) Of course, Philippians 4.8 really says that we should think about things that are true and honorable and pure and lovely and admirable and praiseworthy and we will experience the peace of God. I love how the scriptural and physical align. 
Stress affects not only your body, but your emotions and behavior too. Emotional symptoms of stress are having a short fuse, getting frustrated easily and snapping at others for no reason or for a minor reason. Feeling like you're losing control can be overwhelming. This can lead to isolation, loneliness, and depression. Kathy Lipp and Sherry Gregory wrote a book called Overwhelmed. I put a link for that in the show notes if you want to check it out. Physical symptoms of stress can be difficult to tease away from emotional symptoms like dry mouth, fatigue, aches, and pains. Symptoms like chest pain, rapid heart rate, and difficulty breathing are always worrisome and necessitate medical evaluation. But sometimes the cause is just stress. When I was in my first year of medical school, we studied pathology. And listen, hearing about horrible diseases all day that can kill you got to me. And I developed this strong constriction in my throat, and it was difficult to swallow. I was convinced I had one of those diagnoses I was learning about. Then I sprained my ankle and had to go to the doctor. So I just happened to mention my symptoms about the time he put his hand on the door to leave. He said over his shoulder, Sounds like esophageal spasms, probably just stress. You know what? I never had it again, so I guess he was right. Stress can also cause loss of sexual desire, irregular menstrual cycles, hives, worsening of skin and hair problems. You may think you're losing your mind because you get so forgetful and can't focus because of stress. GI problems are a frequent manifestation of stress, and there's a good reason for that. There are hundreds of millions of neurons in the gut, which send chemical signals back and forth to the brain, resulting in irritable bowel, heartburn, and indigestion. Bacteria in the gut are also a factor, but let's talk about stress, gut health, and mood in a later episode. Stress causes negative thoughts, which then become habit. Unfortunately, bad habits get worse when you're stressed. Some people eat. Some people avoid food. Some people bite their nails, pick their cuticles. I'm guilty of that. Click a pen or pace. That can be an outward manifestation of inward turmoil. When stress sends you over the edge, you may avoid responsibilities. And then people who don't manage their stress tend to use more alcohol, tobacco, drugs, or overeat. Stress causes cognitive symptoms like rumination. Have you ever heard that term? This term comes from a word we use to describe a cow chewing its cud. They just chew and chew and chew. And that's what we do with our worries in our mind, and we never make any progress. Someone once told me, always worry in a straight line, not a circle. Avoid coming back to the same issues over and over. Because when your mind spins, it literally digs a rut in your brain. These neuronal pathways then become easier to slide down. And racing thoughts are difficult to control because worry perpetuates itself. Ready for some good news? Our brains have the ability to create new pathways and thinking patterns. It's called neuroplasticity. Up until about middle age, adults can grow 100 new neurons a day. You can retrain your brain and literally change it. Rewiring the neural pathways increases the thickness of the prefrontal cortex. That's the part of the brain that processes information, makes decisions, and assimilates memories. Gray matter in the hippocampus increases too. That's the area responsible for learning, processing new memories, and emotional regulation. In contrast, gray matter in the amygdala is decreased. Remember, that's the emotional center of the brain where stress and anxiety and negative thoughts camp out. You need strong connections between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala so you can control stress and it doesn't control you. If you're caught up in a worry loop and ready to do some work to break the cycle, check out Winning the Worry Battle by Barbara Roos. It's way more than mind over matter, but keep your brain flexible with curiosity, creativity, and collaboration, otherwise known as community. And while I'm on an alliteration roll, let's throw in contentment. Gratitude and appreciation cultivate satisfaction with your present circumstances. And that's as rewarding as cultivating fresh garden vegetables or flowers. What makes you happy? Dwell on that. It's so important because reducing stress reduces inflammation in the body. Be mindful of what your stress triggers are, whether they're external or internal thoughts, especially automatic negative thoughts. 
Because if you change your thoughts, you can change your emotions, and that leads to changes in behavior. Now, we all have stressors. It's unavoidable. And what's stressful to me might not even seem like a big deal to you. And there are no magic wands in your toolbox. Some people have better coping mechanisms than others, but we can all hone our skills on what works for us. Simple things like massage or hot baths work for some, but not for everyone. There are even apps on your phone that can help you develop your skills. What's most important is to create an action plan for those inevitable stressful moments. In other words, decide in advance how you're going to respond when you know you're walking into a stressful situation. Then rehearse it. Rehearse your response. I used to have patients tell me all the time that they wanted natural childbirth instead of an epidural. And I always encouraged them to take the classes and practice the techniques. Otherwise, all that's going out the window as soon as the pain comes. Stay tuned to this podcast to learn more about the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. Eat a healthy diet, get plenty of restorative sleep, develop and maintain positive social connections, avoid turning to alcohol, tobacco, or drugs, and exercise often. And don't forget to check out all the links in the show notes. This will work together to help you manage stress so it doesn't manage you. And calm, relaxed, and healthy look great on you. The information contained in this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not considered to be a substitute for medical advice. You should continue to follow up with your physician or health care provider and take medication as prescribed. Though the information in this podcast is evidence-based, new research may develop 